thank you, Eric, um, for that. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about um, the upcoming World Cup. And because, Carl, you already mentioned your participation um, in Brazil and Germany and all the experience. I mean, I remember it myself in 2006. I was in Germany, obviously, and everyone was dancing on the streets and um, or even crying on the streets after Germany lost against Italy. I still remember that. Um, <laughs> It won't happen this time. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I had to bring that up. Sorry. <laughs> so maybe um, you remember your time um, even from another perspective. So maybe you can share a bit of your experiences and um, something even what still um, is in your mind. So. Look, hosting a World Cup is, is a nation's ability in the League of Nations to prove who they are and, and almost prove their worth. We'll see that in Russia. A lot of it will be about Putin's desire to see Russia regarded again as a first world power, which since the disintegration of the Soviet bloc has been a sore point for them. Um, I remember it vividly in Germany, my favourite World Cup, for reasons that will become apparent because it was the first time in my life I could see my country, Australia, play. It was the first time in my adult life that Australia qualified. I had worked as a journalist and a broadcaster through the 32-year drought we faced. If you remember, Australia qualified in 1974 with a part-time team. Incredibly, there were only 16 nations qualified for that World Cup. We were one of them. Ironically, we played both Germanys in those days. We played East and West Germany. <laughs> we also played in Berlin, so we had a great tour of, of Germany, the Australians. And you know what, at the time, if I can remember this, I was a teenager, we thought that was the start of the revolution of Australian football. Oh, we're going to go to every World Cup and we're going to take over the world. We didn't realise that it was 32 years before we would go back, ironically, to Germany again in 06. So a few things about that World Cup. I mean. We all know the story of Germany, the fantastic reunification of the country. We know the football story that, that um, when I was there in 1998 in France at the World Cup, Germany had their worst result ever. If you remember it, they got kicked out of the quarterfinals by Croatia, which was a new nation then. Croatia was only four or five years old as a separate country. It was a big crisis, but the response from the German nation in the football was two things. One was the academies that Eric spoke about. They just totally invested in youth development, Secondly, they bid for the World Cup and won it and started to renovate the facilities. So you see the fantastic stadium in Munich, the Allianz Stadium for Bayern. So my experience and also the infrastructure, the friendliness of the people, the hospitality, Germany had everything. It was the perfect World Cup. I remember I saw Brazil, Australia play in, uh, in Munich, 2-0 to, to Brazil. And then we stayed there. We then walked to the downtown. We got on a train bank. We're in the middle of Stuttgart to watch the next game. <laughs> No problem with the train, left on time, hotels were, were cheap, the people were friendly. So the World Cup in Germany for a visitor was, was a fantastic experience because of the infrastructure, the organisation, and as an Australian perspective, that we have lots of people there. For example, I, I've got to give our fans a great deal of faith. I don't know what Eric thinks about our team now, we can press him on that in a moment, but Australia's in the top five nations of people to buy tickets for Russia, even though our team is not favoured at all, but again, we are great travellers and we are great aficionados of the World Cup. So Germany was a fantastic World Cup. I know it was sad for Germany in the semi-finals, but the team there was on an evolution under Klinsmann and they didn't prove enough. I think everyone would say that in hindsight, it was a great result. Brazil again was an incredible defining moment for the nation. I mean, the great economic boom in Brazil had seen Brazil rise up and, and so many people, and particularly the presidency of Lula, I see he's in trouble now, but anyway, he did leave a legacy. <laughs> Um, we saw the mining boom, we saw what happened, that we, we've, everyone who loves Brazil, and I've been there three times myself, we wanted to see that success economically for this nation to come up. And to host the World Cup and the Olympics in back-to-back in -back was incredible. Unfortunately, again, the, I must say this, the infrastructure challenges for Brazil were too big for a big nation. For example, the Australians had to play in Cuiabá the first game. And I had some friends who were thinking they could drive around all the games for Australia. One was Porto Alegre, one was Cojima, one was in Cuiaba. It was like driving to the moon. Anyway, um, and obviously it wasn't possible in that short period for the Brazilian infrastructure, both airports, public transport to catch up. But 
I was there working, my family were all there as, as first time at the World Cup and they had a fantastic time because football is so embedded in the life of Brazil and it was incredible. The taxi drivers, even if they couldn't speak a word of English, wanted to talk about football with, <laughs> with, the, uh, with the visitors. Um, the love of the game, the, the great history, uh, and I won't mention the, the, the history of 1950, because I did a tour with the Maracanã when I was once in Brazil with um, an old guy who was on the ground staff who claimed to have been a ball boy the day that Uruguay upset Brazil in 1950. I'm sure there's a thousand people who say that in Brazil they were, they were ball boys. But look, these World Cups are defining for nations. Um, they, they actually give a, a sense of national pride where you hope people let their national character show the good side. I hope the Russians do that. I hope the Russian people find, as the Germans did in uh, 2006, a sense of joy, of hospitality, of welcoming that will change people's view of Russia, which at the moment is not good. The view of Russia is not good after what's happened in Ukraine, and what's happened in Crimea, and what's happened in other parts. So I'm hoping we'll see that. These things are defining. Um, you know, Australia has had hosted World Youth Cups, and they were great events. Whether we host a, a major World Cup is difficult, but I think this, this World Cup will be good. My son is going, he'll have a great time. He'll start his journey. I hope he gets to go to seven World Cups like I have because they have great ways to enrich your knowledge of fellow man, of language, of all the politics happening in the world. So it should be great. And I think, Eric, you might get to go to your first World Cup. Yes. And if Belgium win, he can take the credit. <laughs> and if they lose, you can blame the idiot coach. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe to add to what Carl said, uh, I, I think um, I had a good, a very good feeling and experience last year because we, because we are uh, the winners of the Asian Cup, we were in the Confederations Cup in, in Russia, so it, it's, it's kind of preparation for, for the World Cup. It was the last time they will organize it, unfortunately. But the only thing I can say about the organization and the stadiums and, and the people, it was top, it was very good, so all people have uh, a negative idea of going there, I would say, uh, I, I think it will be really a top event as a style uh, explained for all the World Cups. Um, just a quick follow up. So, I mean, Australia unfortunately failed to host the 2022 um, World Cup. So, do you see any um, possibility that Australia would bid again for another World Cup? Well, look, it may become impossible for the reason, and, and people who follow the news will see that um, the new genius running FIFA, Gianni Infantino, wants to make the World Cup of 48 nations, 48 nations, at the moment it's 32. It would go from 64 games to 80 games, which is why in 2026 you've got the US, Mexico and Canada jointly bidding because it's just a massive logistical exercise to have 48 teams, even though uh, Infantino is trying to sell this, it's, it's possible, it's logical. Um, we didn't have enough venues in 20, if we had won 2022 World Cup, we didn't have enough venues because if you remember the story, the AFL, which controlled Eddie Head Stadium, said, no, no, you can't play World Cup games there. So we actually didn't have enough stadiums and there was going to have to be stadiums built if we won it. Now, if we couldn't host the 32 team tournament, I don't know how we hosted the 48. Um, we are bidding for the Women's World Cup. I think that's more realistic. So 2023, Women's World Cup, I know there's a lot of effort going on at FFA. I commend that. I think that is a fantastic thing to host. It's a smaller tournament. It can be played at smaller venues, so we don't have to be, the game of football it doesn't have to be held hostage by the AFL and the Rugby League and Rugby Union who have long term leases on other venues. We can play at regional venues like in Boston and Willingong. I think that's good. I think there's opportunities to host the World Youth Cup again. That Australian people watch international sport. We already hosted two. We hosted the 1981 World Youth Cup and 1993, which Brazil won. I don't, I don't want to rub that in for the Germans, but Brazil won. <laughs> but guess who won in 81? Germany. So there you go. Always winning things, Germany and Brazil. So World Youth Cups, Women's World Cups, the rest are out of our league. The TV money on these events now is so stupendous that the European broadcasters will just not pay the money to play a World Cup in our time zone. They'll go to China one day, but that's different, because the economics of going to China are a different thing altogether. They, they didn't mind going to Japan and Korea because half of FIFA's sponsors are Japanese companies, if you look at the, the sponsor board. For us, a small nation, not the right time zone, it would be winter, if we hosted a World Cup June, July, the tourism people wouldn't be that happy. There's a lot of things going against us. We maybe should let, let that dream go and be, aim for something more realistic. 
I only can agree. And I think uh, 2023, the, the World Cup for uh, the women is def definitely an aspiration. And uh, yeah, as you know, the, the medals are qualified for the World Cup in France next year. And to be honest, uh, how the team is developing and evolving at the moment, we, uh, we are a big contender for uh, the big countries there. And if we can win the World Cup or at least playing finals, then uh, it will be a big promotion for the 2023 hosting of the, the World Cup. Just talking about what we're all expecting from Australia at um, the upcoming World Cup. So, what are your bets? Um, is Australia going to survive the group phase? Or? He, he'll get the second. We don't have the same. <laughs> <laughs> what's your bet? Yeah, so, uh, and maybe, maybe to give some more uh, background information, because some of the people they uh, are um, asking why we went for uh, a short term uh, coach for this World Cup. With Beth um, so after the, the period of Ange Postapego, who uh, did a great job with our subgroups, and when he decided to leave for another job, um, there was definitely the view of the Federation and of our technical department to continue with an Australian coach. Uh, because I think, and that's my opinion, and if you look to all the World Cup winners over time, all the teams who won the World Cup were coached by an national coach, by their own national coach. So I think there is a, a big benefit in having your own national coach. The only thing was that, and Carl can make that opinion, <coughs> the expectations in Brazil, when Ange was only for three months as a head coach there, the expectations with the group of that, with Netherlands, Chile and Spain, were very low. And so everything we could do and the result was, was a positive one. Whereas now, with winning the Asian Cup in 2015, uh, with having, I think, a decent team um, in the rails, uh, expectation for this World Cup with the draw with France, Denmark, and Peru is a little bit different. So, when we were looking after a new coach, we looked in the first phase after Australian coach, but we didn't find a potential one who had World Cup experience because we think that with someone in place where has some World Cup experience. Maybe we can go through the group phase. That's why we appointed Bertrand Malwerk and some of his uh, assisting staff to lead this team to the World Cup in Russia. And after the World Cup, Graham Arnold, successful coach of Sydney FC, he will take over and he gets a four year time. And as we know, it's depending on results, but he gets a four year time to qualify again for the 2022 <coughs> in Qatar. So that's a little bit the, the context about it. And I think, uh, and I spoke with, with uh, Carl just before, before the meeting, I think with France as the first game, and as we know that most of the top teams, even in the first game, are a little bit easy, uh, there's maybe a good chance that we can make a positive result against France. Maybe have a small lose, which will not, um, or will boost a little bit the confidence of our team. And with the two other games, Denmark and Peru, definitely there are competitors, we, we have a chance to overcome them and that will be that will be maybe a chance to go through the group phase. Well Eric sums up Australia, I think for me the, the big the big test here is that it's very hard for a South American team to win in Europe. It's only happened once in nineteen fifty eight in Sweden when Brazil with a teenage Pelé had that win. But in the modern era as football has become more uh, competitive internationally, it's very hard for the South American teams to win Europe. I don't know why that is, it just, it just hasn't really had any success. So I think 